Hello, this is the last lecture of this series and this lecture I will cover the basis set. Basis set is how we representing the wave functions. So let's review how do we representing the wave functions. Okay, so for the uh, Hartree-Fock and DFT wave functions, uh, the wave function, the multi electrons uh, wave function is represented by the slatter determinant. Uh, so uh, the slatter determinants, the way we present it is chi one, chi two, chi to chi n, and and the orbitals this way, and the electron this way, electron one, electron two, and electron n. Chi is a spin orbitals, uh, as we mentioned earlier, and it is just a spatial molecular orbitals times the spin, either alpha or beta. Okay. Now, how is the we representing the molecular orbitals? The molecular orbitals represent as a linear combinations of the atomic orbitals, uh, as in the LCAO approximations. We expand it by the atomic orbitals, uh, and this is MO coefficients. We use variational principles to determine them. This set of orbitals uh, unknown form. Uh, 1s, 2s, 2px, 2py, 2bz is known. In principle, uh, we done. Uh, uh, there's only little problems. Okay? The only little problems is uh, that in the Hartree Fox or DFT, we have these. Uh, uh, mainly in how to find. We have these two electron integrals, uh, integrals of over the atomic orbitals um, uh, of uh, two electrons, it, phi mu, phi nu, and one over the distance between uh, electron one and two, lambda and sigma. Um, and uh, integrated, this has six degree of freedoms uh, integrals. Uh, so uh, it's very, very complicated if we're using the, these, these orbitals that are similar to the hydrogen atoms. Uh, we call the slider type orbitals, right? For example, the 1s functions orbitals who have e to the minus r, the effective exponent, and r, e to the minus r like functions. And go into the, the six degree of freedoms here. And remember, we have this basis set that we expand the MO in, and the basis set K, and this one, two, three, four. So there is probably is about K to the four number of integrals. And, and it's easy getting very, very quickly to feel K can get into the hundreds and some uh, basis function very quickly. Uh, as you can see in the later part of this lecture. So these uh, a lot of these six degree of freedoms integrals need to evaluate and it's very complicated and time consuming. And uh, we need to find a better way to representing these atomic orbitals. Okay, the idea here is to use the Gaussian functions. So that's idea Gaussian type orbitals. Let's take a look how that we using this uh, Gaussian type orbital. A Gaussian function, for example, the S function, the zero S, you see that, that this is coefficients, a normalized uh, function, uh, e to the minus alpha r square. This is a Gaussian function, is a r to the square. Remember the S function is e to the minus r. So this r square. So if you plotting out the one S functions, and the Gaussian function, the Gaussian is because e to the minus r square, so it drops faster, it drops to zero faster. Okay? So, um, so that's the key difference. However, using Gaussian functions, um, these two electron install is easy and fast. Right? We can calculate it very fast. So, the idea here is why don't we using uh, a contracted Gaussian uh, idea. So that means we're taking a number of Gaussians 
uh, we pack and we fit it to uh, these ladder type orbitals or the hydrogen like orbitals. Um, so the same uh, idea like uh, expansion idea. So let's look and see how accurate it could have. If we take the one as a hydrogen atom, okay, so one as orbitals, if we take one Gaussians, represented by one Gaussians, that's is minus 0.424, and the exact is minus 0.5, okay? Now, if we use two Gaussians to fit it to that one S uh, functions here, then we will get the energies to minus 0.485. Now, if we get three Gaussians here, three, and we fit it, this is a fitting function, all right, the weighted fit functions, we fit it, and uh, we get minus 4.97, getting pretty good for minus 5. If we get 4, you get a 0 0.499, two digits already, they get to the four digits, all right, and we get a 10 Gaussian, we practically get to the exact number. But for practical purpose, in many actual applications, we usually stop at 3000. Okay? So we call it STO3G. Uh, that means using 3000 functions to fit it to a slider type orbitals. Right? Okay. The basis set now is that we start out with a minimal. Minimal. We call minimal basis set STOKG. Typically, as to 3GK, that's the number of Gaussian to fit it. Um, most software programs uh, have as to 3G. Okay? Uh, here, a uh, minimal basis is saying that I would have a minimal set of atomic orbitals that require for each atom. Uh, of course, it's, I need to have a complete shell of these atomic orbitals. In this case, helium, uh, hydrogen, and helium. I need only one S orbitals. For lithium and neon, I would need one S for the core, two S, two PX, two PY, and two PZ for the violent shell electrons. Even lithium only require two S. You need to add all orbitals of that shell, two PX, two PY, and two PZ, also there. And and the, the reason is here is that we explained the orbital hybridizations in previous lectures that it, 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 it borrowed that empty orbitals there to hybridize orbital to prepare for bonding. Okay. Now, one thing that we recognize that chemistry occur in the violent shell. Right, electron balance. So, so if we want to improve the accuracy of the wave functions, we need to find a way to improve the valence shell orbitals. And it's the idea of split valence basis set. The idea here is, again, if you look at, if for example, here is two p orbitals, and uh, I would say, okay, instead of fitting uh, the entire functions here, I would cut it in and I said, well, this is the inner part and this outer part that are independent parts of these valence orbitals, valence shell orbitals, and I would fit separately. So for the split valence basis sets, I would say, well, I really don't have to worry so much to the core, so I use a minimal basis set for the core, uh, inner shell, for the cores, and for the valence shell, I'll split double, here is double, or I can split triple, uh, zeta, or I use a different exponents for that, for the valence shell. Here is the example uh, of the basis set, it's well known as 631G basis set. Uh, what does that mean? The inner shell for the core electrons, I would use 6 Gaussians to fit for the inner shell orbital. For the valence shell, you see that they have two numbers here, so that double zeta. I'll split the inner part and the outer part into two parts. The inner part is three here, so that I use three Gaussians right, to fit to that atomic orbitals. That part, the inner part, 
and the outer part I would use 1000 so I make sure that I get the tail part of the balance orbitals correctly so look at this for in this case helium uh, hydrogen and helium the first row well, I have only valence shell, so I would have two functions, split valence, two, right? Three and one. I have two parts, two here, one S and one S prime. For lithium and neons, right? The core is a one S, so I only use one, right? One basis function, the one S. The valence shells, I split out to two parts, right? The inner part, 2s to px to py to pz for the inner and the outer component is 2s to px you see this is the double part the split double so now you see that the the number of the basis functions in the split valence increase uh, quite a bit here what more well there's other effects that uh, we need to also account for this is uh, in effect we call polarizations. So how do we understand it? Uh, how do we understand this effect? So here is a hydrogen atom. So you have a nuclear charge of proton, and the electron densities of the one s is spherically uh, surrounding this, um, this 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 proton, this nucleus. What happens if I bring a positive charge? You can think of it as another nucleus in the molecule. Positive charge, please. But what happened to the electron cloud? Well, you see that the electron cloud shifted toward the positive charge. The problem is the S function is spherical functions. It's only one degree of freedom. So you only expand it or you shrink. But you cannot lump it a spherical function to have that kind of lumpy uh, shape like that. So the way we do this is that we adding higher, like we add a p function here. We add a, we add a p. Right? We add a higher angular momentum orbitals, right, to provide for this effect, to account for this the polarization effect. So for the s here to add a p, you see that if I add a p, it would make the orbital lopsided. So, in order to account for polarization effects, the way we do this is we adding higher angular momentum orbitals to the base itself. For example, right, six three one g split valence. As you see that the, the, the notation is d and p. The first part of it is polarization for heavy atoms. The second part of it is polarizations for the hydrogen atoms. Here, d orbitals are added to the heavy atoms. Here's p orbitals, px, py, pz, added to hydrogen atoms to account for polarization effects. Now, what next? Well, for negative ions and for excited states, Electrons uh, can explore the space further out uh, from the nucleus uh, than the, the normal orbitals in neutral molecules. And to accounting for these effects, we add diffuse functions. Diffuse functions are normal atomic orbitals with a very small exponential that have very long tail. Uh, so, the, so that allow the electron to explore the space out there. So if the notation is if we have one plus, that means we adding a set of s orbitals diffuse and a p uh, no, uh, and a p or uh, diffuse orbitals uh, to heavy atoms, right? So heavy atoms that means uh, in the second row, third row, and so on. Uh, that 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 further from the nucleus. So that's that diffuse function for heavy atoms are more important. And then the next things then we add in the second plus, that means we also add a set of S diffuse functions to hydrogen atoms. So typically a notation would be an S31, a single plus, 
GDP. So here we add in diffuse function to heavy atoms. Here, 2 plus, that means we add diffuse functions to heavy atoms and also hydrogen atoms. All right? As you can see that by this time here, the number of basis functions uh, for a single atom can be allowed. So here's some practical uh, considerations when you start uh, using software to, to, to calculate uh, pro chemical properties. Improving the basis set, you starting from the minimal basis set, and you improve the valence, uh, electron by golden split valence, double or, or triples, uh, uh, and then uh, you uh, next level of, 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 of improvements will be adding the polarization functions, and then uh, further up it would go to the diffuse functions. So that's layer of improvements. You don't go from main, uh, mini, uh, minimal basis set and then you add the few functions in there. That's not a way to do it. Okay? You, you go layer by layer. Right? Stop. So, so, for example here, right? minimal split balance, polarization, and diffuse. And you go on to, you can add as many operators you like. As you go to the basis set limits, it could be a humongous number of atomic orbitals that you can include in the basis set. Now we have covered a number of methods. Uh, we start out with hardy fog and then the errors we call it electron correlations. Uh, and we mentioned that uh, DFT perturbation theories, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the configuration interaction, couple clusters and we want to go to go to four CIs and so on. So if, if we look at that is the basis set limit that we have a humongous basis set and you go to four CI uh, method and you use that, uh, that's what you want to get. That's the best answer. Uh, usually it's impractical because that would worry. It doesn't matter how, what, how big uh, of a computer is, uh, you have. Or you can have access to that is impractical. So in practical, uh, here is the regions of practicality. Right? Uh, so uh, in, in lower level methods, you can uh, go up to a, a larger basis set, but a, a very high level uh, of methods, uh, for example, a uh, couple clusters, single double would some triple excitation correction to it, you cannot go to a very large basis set uh, because it's very expensive uh, to do. So this is an area of practicality. So if you're reading, uh, you're reading uh, many uh, papers in the literature, you see that they, they usually fall in this range uh, method that they use to calculate uh, chemical properties. Well, I hope that uh, you enjoy this series uh, of lecture. Uh, again, this series of lectures here is only at the level, uh, undergraduate level, uh, sophomore or senior level. It providing a, a basic framework for quantum chemistry. Uh, these basic frameworks that allow you to have some understandings uh, when you're using quantum chemistry software to predict properties. Um, uh, experimentalists or practitioners uh, may find these uh, lectures are uh, useful as well. And again, I hope you enjoyed this series of lecture. Bye-bye.